Yeah? Okay, I see. Yeah, I'll get him right now. Mr. Nidell? Yeah? There's a call for you on line one. Line one. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Hello? Ah! What? Yeah, okay, so they, they had it for five months. Yeah, so they, they must have gotten a lot of oil, right? No. Well, how come? Unreasonable expectations is putting it mildly. Okay, well, what's putting it strongly then? As untethered from reality as... As who was? Who? Who's Michael Jackson? Okay. January 8th, 1943. The German relief attack to reach and rescue their encircled forces begins this week. You might be thinking, wait, wait, wait a second. Winter storm to reach Stalingrad started in mid-December, but this is not Stalingrad. This is Veliki Luki. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese decided that they will pull out of Guadalcanal. Their Axis allies were also withdrawing from the Caucasus and also being pushed back north of it. They were also still surrounded at Stalingrad and Veliki Luki, so not a very strong beginning to 1943 for the Axis powers. However, Ivan Maslenikov's offensive in the Caucasus that forced Ewald von Kleist to withdraw his Axis forces to the Kuma River does continue this week, but seems to be slowing down. Kleist forces defend that line for a few days before falling back to the Kalawas line east of Armavir. Stavka is criticizing Maslenikov for his pursuit and for allowing Kleist to break contact, but except for a couple cavalry corps, he doesn't really have the force for a long pursuit. Still, on the 2nd, the Soviets retake Mozdok, held by the Axis since August, and Malgobek, and retake Nalchik the 5th. Today, the 8th, Soviet forces retake Zimovniki on the railway line from Stalingrad to Novorossiysk, and this increases the threat to Kleist. You know, Hermann Goering and Conti O had really promised an oil bonanza from taking the Caucasus oil fields. But from when they took Maykop in mid-August to now, they've only extracted a thousand tons or so total, and it looks like they'll soon have to abandon that city. Also, the oil that has been extracted has been used locally. None has gone back to Germany. Estimates are that it would take until late 1943 to restore it to large-scale production, like over 50,000 tons a month. But you know, they'd have to hold the city until then. And another also, Joseph Stalin has ordered new wells drilled in Ural's oil fields, so Soviet oil production has actually increased lately, despite losing Maykop for months. One city that, like Maykop, was supposed to fall months ago and lead to other good things is Stalingrad. But if you're German, then the struggle for it has only led to the bad. In the last two weeks of 1942, Friedrich Paulus's Sixth Army, currently trapped in Stalingrad, took 11,066 casualties. Add that to the 22,500 or so from the beginning of the Soviet counteroffensive on November 21st until mid-December, and that's 33,000. Army combat strength on December 18th was reported at just 28,200 men. Starting December 19th, there were three new categories added to six Army's daily casualty reports. Soldiers frostbitten, soldiers dead from starvation or exhaustion, and those who died of disease. Also starting December 19th, though, were Soviet plans to liquidate the Stalingrad pocket, Operation Ring. Stavka got Nikolai Voronov to coordinate attack plans for the coming year. So, now. It is no coincidence that Voronov is the Red Army's senior artillery officer. This time around, they plan to rely on crushing artillery. He presented a three-stage plan last week on the 27th for the Don and Stalingrad fronts to take care of Sixth Army in seven days of fighting. Konstantin Rokossovsky's Don Front's 24th, 65th, and 21st Armies will be the main attack. And their main attack force will be 14 rifle divisions strong, backed by eight tank and 41 artillery and mortar regiments against Sixth Army's Western Front, which is supposed to be the enemy's weakest area. 
Their goal is to break right through the defense and head due east to eventually reach Krasnyi Oktyabr village at the western edge of the Stalingrad factory district. There are to be supporting attacks from 66th Army from northwest of Orlovka and the 57th and 64th Armies towards Voroponovo. Now, Voronov thought they could launch the attacks this week on the 6th, and that the breakthrough from the west would take only two days to achieve. I must say that Voronov underestimates the enemy's strength if he really thinks that that's going to happen so quickly. But things do move forward. Stavka makes alterations to the plan, but the problem is that the armies to be used are under the control of two separate fronts, which is going to make coordination and just command complicated. But this time, they actually do something about that. As I mentioned last week, the Stalingrad front becomes the southern front, and the 62nd, 64th, and 57th armies are assigned to the Don front, so there will be unity of command for Operation Ring and for the drive on Rostov, which will hopefully cut off Kleist's army group. But there's planning way beyond that going on this week. Stavka is now considering much larger objectives than just liquidating 6th Army. All the Red Army victories of November and December have them ready for more. And what Stalin wants is not only to defeat all of Army Group B and Army Group Don, but to also destroy Army Group A before it can vacate the Caucasus. And, in fact, we're looking at offensives to go off from the Gulf of Finland to the Black Sea. The first stage is a series of directives issued early this week. The southwestern, southern, and Transcaucasian fronts will launch Operation Don, aiming towards Rostov and to defeat Group Holit north of the Don River and the 4th Panzer Army south of it. They would close the door on Army Group A's escape. There is also an ostrogorsk rossosh offensive against the Hungarian 2nd Army and the Italian Alpine Corps in the works, and then an offensive against the German 2nd Army further north near Voronezh. But Operation Ring has to go off first, and is now scheduled for January 10th. The armies involved launch limited attacks this week to gain good jumping-off points and to weaken the enemy. The Germans are trying an offensive of their own this week, a relief offensive aimed at Veliki Luki, since the garrison trapped there is out of everything. Hauptmann Darneda's group at the Citadel was particularly difficult to supply. Most parachute containers fell into Russian hands. On the 3rd of January, Darneda's group ran out of water and had eaten all of their horses. German morale was increasingly brittle as the prospect of defeat grew nearer. Operation Totilia, the relief attack, begins the 4th at 8.30 a.m. Within an hour, they've taken Alexei Kovo and Ivantsevo. By the afternoon, though, the Soviet resistance has stiffened. On the 5th, further attacks are bogged down, but they are ordered to continue the 6th to make physical contact with Veliki Luki Citadel. The Soviets attack first, the 6th, though, with bombers and fighter bombers. But still, both that day and then today, the Germans manage to make advances, though as the week ends, they still have not taken anything that can really be called a consolidated jumping-off position for attacks towards the Citadel. Though, they do take Gribushino six kilometers from the Citadel, but the Germans in the city are getting weaker and weaker and weaker. One Axis force that has been very much weakened already is the Japanese on Guadalcanal. There are now 50,000 Americans on Guadalcanal. The Japanese are down to 11,000. On the 2nd, all three battalions of the 132nd Regiment attack on Mount Austin, and Hill 27 is entirely taken before noon. But heavy enemy artillery and infantry attacks cause them to move to the reverse slope by the end of the day. They retake the crest to 3rd, and by the end of the 4th, the gaps between the battalion's lines are sealed up. They will now just hold position, so starting the 4th, they set their defenses at the north, east, and south of the Gifu, the strong Japanese defense system. They've taken pretty heavy losses the past three weeks, and they're not really in any position for further attacks. As for the defenders, Lieutenant Ko'o writes in his diary that the last food in the Gifu is given out New Year's Day. Two crackers and a piece of candy per man. Well... We know that the Japanese have officially decided to evacuate Guadalcanal. 
On the third, the orders at Truk go out to the staff officers. The Imperial Japanese Army will run the defense of the Northern Solomons, including Shortland, Bougainville, and Buka. The Imperial Japanese Navy will run the Middle Solomons, New Georgia and Santa Isabel, and Isoroku Yamamoto's combined fleet will deal with the reinforcement of Lai, Salamaua, and Madang to beef up New Guinea. The Imperial Air Force will fight over New Guinea, and the Navy's Air Force will assist them and fight over the Solomons. But they will both commit to Operation KE, the evacuation of Guadalcanal, scheduled for late January and early February. Of course, the Americans will be trying to push them out, whatever the case. On the 5th, Alexander Patch issues his plans for the clearing of Guadalcanal of Japanese. Well, phase one. The 25th Division Intelligence Officer described Patch's information on Japanese strength and dispositions as sketchy. The general character of Japanese positions was somewhat clear, but not the unit identification or locations. A line heading south from the beach about three kilometers west of the current position is to be 14th Corps' objective. In the north, the second Marines would push west with their flank along the shore. Their left boundary will be the fork of the Matanikau. The 25th Division will be to the south of them, and they are not only to head west, but also to take out the Gifu. They have no southern boundary, but there are natural barriers south of Mount Austin. And 25th's territory can be cut into three distinct areas, each with one main terrain feature, Mount Austin, of course, east of the Matanikau. Between the southeast and southwest forks of the Matanikau are two hills called the Seahorse. And between the southwest and northwest forks is a big bare hill called the Galloping Horse. Those are the three. 25th's battle plan is to basically surround these into three big pockets and then reduce them. The Japanese 17th Army is aware that an attack is coming. Their situation reports on both the 5th and 6th to Rabaul say they think it's imminent. The general idea for their defense, however, is what Richard Frank calls an attempt to formalize sheer desperation. Basically, they are to just remain at their posts, whatever happens. The Americans will infiltrate between those posts through gaps in the front and then will not be able to exploit their firepower advantage. And the Japanese would come out at night and prevent the forward American units from being supplied. The result will either be the whole offensive getting stuck or the Americans being forced to reduce each Japanese position, which will by then have hopefully been reinforced. There is other news from the region this week. On the second, Buna mission finally falls to the Americans and Australians. The Japanese colonel in charge and some of the officers kill themselves rather than surrender. On the fourth, a Japanese surprise attack near Tarakena allows them to rescue some of the remnants of the Buna garrison. And on the seventh and eighth come Japanese landings at Lai. This convoy was hit hard, but they do land some 4,000 men. And here I will bring this week to an end. A week of fighting on Guadalcanal, a relief attack at Veliki Luki, and plans for not just Operation Ring to eliminate the Stalingrad pocket, but plans for a whole bunch of Soviet offensives along the entire front. Also, today on the 8th, after last week's message to American President Franklin Roosevelt that he will be ready to launch an offensive this spring, Chiang Kai-shek now turns down Roosevelt's suggestion that he do so. Something else that really needs to be mentioned today that I shall end with. On the 7th, Voronov and Rokossovsky make radio contact with German 6th Army to tell Paulus that they are sending two emissaries under a flag of truce today, the 8th. The emissaries are blindfolded and taken into the German positions where they give their ultimatum to a major Willig. Willig gets it to Paulus. It reads in part, To the commander of 6th German Army encircled at Stalingrad, Colonel General Paulus or his deputy, All hope of saving your forces by means of an offensive by German forces from the south and southwest are unjustified. The German forces which were hastening to assist you have been beaten by the Red Army, and the remnants of these forces are retreating to Rostov. German transport aircraft have suffered huge losses in aircraft and crews from the Russian aircraft. 
their help to the encircled forces has become unrealistic. The situation of your encircled forces is difficult. They are suffering from hunger, disease, and cold. The harsh Russian winter is only just beginning, and your soldiers have not been supplied with winter clothing. You have no real possibilities whatsoever for penetrating the encirclement ring. Your position is hopeless, and further resistance can serve no purpose whatsoever. In view of your hopeless situation, and to avoid senseless bloodshed, we offer you the following terms for surrender. They offer terms, turn over everything, you'll be a prisoner till the end of the war, normal rations and care for the sick, that sort of stuff. A response is expected by three o'clock tomorrow. I wonder what Paulus will reply. There is still one place, smack in the center of the European continent, that has not been invaded by the Axis powers and is kind of surrounded by them. I am talking about Switzerland. If you want to see a special I did about Switzerland's position in all of this, you can click right here for that. And these are the newest commissioned officers in the Time Ghost Army. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Alexei Prokharchik. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it is the army that finances all of our productions. So to get ever more of them, ever more specials, ever more series, ever more Time Ghost stuff, ever more World War II stuff, join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe. I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.